World News Tonight. Aiding Afghans. Past leaders of the United States come together in hopes of resettling the innocent. Vaccine mayhem. The WHO warn of an increasing jab inequality which may lead to greater variant threats. Nuclear mayhem. South Korea addresses claims of detection errors in the latest nuclear attacks. A grand reveal. Apple sets the stage for the next best thing in the world of user technology. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from updates on Afghanistan. Not all hope is lost for Afghans in need of protection as a brand new group formed by former US presidents has announced their efforts of pitching in to resettle innocents caught in the conflict. Three former U.S. presidents, Barack Obama, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton, have banded together behind a new group aimed at supporting refugees from Afghanistan settling in the United States. The former U.S. leaders and their wives will serve as a part of Welcome.us, a coalition of advocacy groups, U.S. businesses and other leaders launching on Tuesday. In a statement, Welcome.us said it will help tens of thousands of Afghans fleeing their country following the U.S. withdrawal by mobilizing support and volunteers. In the statement, George W. Bush and his wife Laura said, quote, thousands of Afghans stood with us on the front lines to push for a safer world, and now they need our help. We are proud to support Welcome.us and the work to help Afghan families get settled and build new lives. Representatives for Bill Clinton and his wife, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama and his wife Michelle could not be immediately reached for comment. The council also draws support from more than 280 people and entities, including U.S. businesses such as Microsoft, Starbucks, CVS Health, and Airbnb, as well as numerous nonprofit organizations, veterans groups, and resettlement agencies. Tens of thousands of refugees were airlifted out of Afghanistan in recent weeks in a hasty pullout that drew some sharp criticism. Democratic President Joe Biden's administration is working to accommodate as many as 50,000 refugees on military bases in the United States. Republican former President Donald Trump was not listed as part of the effort. Former Democratic President Jimmy Carter, who is 96, was also not listed. President Biden may have been turned down by his Chinese counterpart in holding the first face-to-face -face meeting between the two leaders, a report which the White House denied. U.S. President Joe Biden proposed a first face-to-face -face meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping in a call last week. However, the Financial Times reported on Tuesday Biden was unable to secure it. Biden later told reporters it was not true that he was turned down by his Chinese counterpart. A source briefed on last week's 90-minute call confirmed, however, that the report was accurate and that, quote, she apparently intimated that the tone and atmosphere of the relationship needed to be improved first. China's embassy in Washington did not respond to a request for comment. The FT reported that she did not engage with Biden's idea of a summit, which the White House believed was partly due to the global health crisis. The G20 summit in Italy next month had been floated as a possible venue for their meeting, but she has not left China since the first outbreak early last year. The call between the two leaders was their first in seven months. They discussed the need to stray from possible conflict amid the worst bilateral relations in decades. The White House said after the call that it intended to keep lines of communication open, but announced no plans to follow up. China state media reported that Beijing agreed to ramp up lower-level talks. With the pandemic continuously racking less and less cases in Japan, all eyes are on the front-runners of the country's latest selection for the future of Japan's ruling LDP party. Let's cross over to Ada Derana World News special correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan for more. Rasita? Well, Anradi, as the uh, daily COVID cases are drastically going down, and the day, as so as the daily uh, death rates, all attention, all the public attention now on LDP election. So far, we only have three candidates, which is far fewer than we expected before. And the deadline to declare the candidates is on this Friday. We have Kishida-san, former foreign minister, Konotaro-san, a current vaccination minister, as well as Takaichi-san, another former, uh, former minister. Interestingly, Ishiba-san, uh, uh, someone who ran four times previously, 
have not declared his candidacy and he is expected to support Kono-san. Uh, Ishimo-san met Kono Taro-san the other day and they had a very long discussion, probably discussed the strategy of the, this leadership election. So this comes as no surprise considering both Kono Taro-san and Ishiba-san are immensely popular among the LDP's uh, regional membership. And don't forget the fact that this election is decided by not just by the parliamentarian and also by the regional party members and the vote is evenly split 50-50. And, and, and Kono Taro-san and Ishiba-san together have uh, the polls given them nearly 50% of the party regional voters even though they are a bit of struggling to get the parliamentarian votes. Now let's see these uh, main uh, the interesting roles and all those uh, the kingmakers in the LDP. Prime Minister Suga-san is expected to leave uh, once the new leader is elected and uh, rumors say he will most probably support Kono Taro-san and he may declare once the, uh, once the deadline comes on Friday that his support for the Kono Taro-san. And uh, there's a popular young minister, Koishimi Shinjiro-san, he declared his uh, support for Kono Taro-san uh, yesterday. Both Shinjiro-san and Kono Taro-san, they represent same uh, represent constituencies in same Kanagawa prefecture, so as the Suga-san, and they have their bond for, for many years because they represent the same region. And party general secretary, the powerful Nikai-san, he is also expected to support Kono Taro-san. And we look at the two main uh, kingmakers in the LDP, Abe Shinzo and Asotaro. Abe Shinzo, the powerful ex-Prime Minister, have already declared his support for Takaichi-san, even though he's kind of struggling to get his uh, faction, the biggest faction in the ruling LDP, uh, to support Takaichi as a faction. In fact, his, uh, uh, his faction declared yesterday that uh, they would go for, uh, they would not support a certain candidates and they would allow their members to suffer to vote freely. Uh, Aso-san's faction may go the same way. Even though Kono Taro-san represents the Aso faction, uh, Aso-san has given just uh, half-hearted support to his candidacy and they may even allow their members to vote free. So, all said, the election is set on 29th and the three candidates uh, most probably will be the final three candidates and the winner will be decided by the majority not the plurality so that means the chances are high that this would vote for the second round that means the second round vote is decided by the parliamentarian votes only 10 years ago in 2012 Ishiba-san won the first round but in the in the runoff election Abe-san defeated him because Abe-san had far more support in the parliamentarian faction so this means the kingmakers, Abe-san and the Asotaro-san, they may have the final laugh because when it comes to the second round, there are bigger factions and their authority in the parliamentarian membership who can create uh, a scenario that they prefer. Whether they'll make the next king or the queen, we would know on 29th September. Over to you, Anwar. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News special correspondent Rasiti Chandradasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. A slew of information regarding North Korea's recent test fires and military parade was released by Seoul's defense minister at a parliamentary session. He dismissed allegations that the nation's military did not detect the missiles. South Korea's defense minister Seo Ka said the military assets of South Korea and the U.S. detected North Korea's latest test fire of long-range cruise missiles before the North reported the launch. His remarks came during a regular session of the National Assembly on Tuesday amid speculation that South Korea's military was not able to detect the missiles in advance and was not able to alert the public right away. On Monday, the North reported its missiles have flown for some 126 minutes and successfully hit a target 1,500 kilometers away during its test launches on Saturday and Sunday. Seoul's defense minister said South Korea is already capable of intercepting North Korea's cruise missiles via early detection and that the military continues to enhance its defense capabilities through close observation. He didn't elaborate on when or how they were detected, but said specific details regarding the recent launch are being analyzed by the alliance. 
Regarding the North's cruise missile technology, Seoul said the defense ministry has been aware of its development since the early 2000s and that North Korea is executing its accumulated technology in full swing. Haiti's Prime Minister Ariel Henry sacked his top prosecutor, who was seeking charges against the Premier over the July assassination of President Jovenel Moise. Ariel Henry, Haiti's new Prime Minister, a former Minister of Labor, a former neuropathologist, now a suspect in the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. On Tuesday, Haiti's top prosecutor recommended charges against Henri over Moise's killing. Henri responded by swiftly and publicly firing that chief prosecutor, whose replacement was sworn in within hours. The prime minister has insisted he's innocent in the Moise affair. Moise was shot to death in the early hours of July 7th, when a group of commandos posing as U.S. drug enforcement agents stormed his residential compound. Dozens have been arrested in the wake of the raid, including 18 former Colombian soldiers and two Haitian Americans. But several key suspects remain at large, including a fugitive former employee of the Justice Ministry's anti-corruption unit, whom Henri has publicly defended. Prosecutors say the prime minister spoke with that suspect twice by telephone on the night of Moise's assassination. Henri dismissed their requests to question him as political theater, and only the country's president has the authority to compel a sitting prime minister to undergo interrogation. The Constitution also stipulates, however, that prosecutors can only be fired or appointed by the president, a position that remains vacant since Moise's death. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now for the latest updates on the COVID pandemic. COVID booster jabs will begin to be offered across the UK. It follows a recommendation from the government's vaccine advisors, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization. For further details on this, we now cross over to other Derana World News special correspondent Dilini Senivratna reporting now from London in the UK. Dilini? Yes, I'm Rolly. The UK will roll out booster shots to over 50 starting next week with the dose of an mRNA vaccine, even if previous doses received were AstraZeneca. Authorities also said that vaccines saved 112,000 lives and averted 24 million cases of the disease. The eligible population for the booster shot stands at over 30 million and includes over 50s, younger adults with health conditions and frontline health and care workers. This is all part of the country's Plan A ahead of winter, with other measures to include encouraging the unvaccinated to get jabbed and offering vaccines to 12 to 15 year olds. Plan B will be initiated if the National Health Service is under unsustainable pressure and measures will include mandatory vaccine passports for mass events and mandating mask wearing in public places. Health Secretary Sajid Javid made the announcement in the Commons as part of an autumn and winter plan for managing COVID in England. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Dilini Seniviratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. The World Health Organization has again slammed the global inequality of COVID-19 vaccines, warning that it's starting to pose a grave threat to the rest of the world as it could spawn new variants going forward. The WHO has sharply criticized the global imbalance in the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, explaining that Africa lags far behind in terms of reaching vaccination targets. WHO's global targets are to support every country to vaccinate at least 40% of its population by the end of this year and 70% of the world's population by the middle of next year. So far, just two countries in Africa have reached the 40% target, the lowest of any region. The WHO chief said this comes despite the fact that many rich countries are beginning to offer booster shots to their citizens. He also warned that such inequity could hurt the international community as a whole. Nevertheless, he stressed that it's a problem that can be solved, calling for pharmaceutical giants to prioritize COVAX and African Vaccine Acquisition Trust when distributing shots. The 
The WHO also pressed countries with high vaccination rates to swap their near-term vaccine deliveries. The remarks come as the African Union has been imploring vaccine producers to give the continent a fair shot for market access. The union urged vaccine manufacturing countries, especially India, to lift export restrictions on COVID-19 jabs and their components. It added that Africa should not be just relying on global vaccine sharing, highlighting that African countries should have the opportunity to buy them directly from the manufacturers. Out of some 5.7 billion doses administered around the world, only 2 percent have been done in Africa so far. Africa is on the path to vaccine independence as plans to develop a tech transfer hub that will replicate Moderna's jabs has been revealed. However, it may be an uphill battle as talks with the U.S. company have not yet yielded results. Efforts to develop an African hub to manufacture COVID-19 vaccines will focus on replicating Moderna's shot, a senior WHO official has told. But he added a lack of progress in talks with the U.S. pharmaceuticals company means the project will take time. The World Health Organization-backed tech transfer hub in South Africa was set up in June. Its aim is to give poorer nations the know-how to produce vaccines. Cape Town-based Afrigen Biologics has been selected to produce the first doses. Martin Fried, coordinator of the WHO's initiative for vaccine research, said Moderna's vaccine was chosen because of an abundance of public information and because the company has said it will not enforce patents. But in practice, it's hard to replicate a vaccine without information on how it's made. Fried said talks with Moderna have not yielded any results. Moderna did not respond to a request for comment. COVID-19 vaccine makers have warned that non-authorized producers would compete for vital raw materials and production equipment. Those are relied upon by established players, who for the most part have earned huge profits from vaccination. We have some good news for you. The world's largest plant that sucks carbon dioxide directly from the air and deposits it underground is due to start operating. Swiss startup Climeworks AG, which specializes in capturing carbon dioxide directly from the air, has partnered with Icelandic carbon storage firm Carbfix to develop a plant that sucks up to 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. That's the equivalent of annual emissions of about 790 cars. Direct air capture is one of the few technologies extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and is viewed by scientists as vital to limit global warming. Blame for causing more heat waves, wildfires, floods and rising sea levels. US oil firm Occidental is currently developing the largest direct air capture facility to pull 1 million tons per year of carbon dioxide from the open air near some of its Texas oil fields. Climeworks, which recently signed a 10-year carbon removal purchase agreement with major insurance firm Swiss Re, also offers a subscription service which allows consumers to pay for carbon removal through monthly payments. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Maldivian diplomat Abdullah Shahid, who was elected as president of the 76th UNGA in June, took the oath of office during the ceremony and received the gavel from Volkan Bozkir, president of the 75th UNGA. The Venezuelan government wants a top envoy that has been charged with money laundering and is close to President Nicolas Maduro to take part in its political dialogue with the opposition, a move that threatens to stir tensions. Yet another billionaire entrepreneur is set to ride into space, strapped inside the capsule of SpaceX rocket ship as part of an astro-tourist team, poised to make history as the first all-civilian crew launched into Earth orbit. And finally tonight, Apple unveiled the iPhone 13 and a new iPad mini, expanding 5G connectivity and showing off faster chips and sharper cameras without raising the phone's price. This is what drives us to create the best iPhone possible to create an experience unlike any other with legendary ease of use. Let's go. Go, 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 go. This is iPhone 13. Apple CEO Tim Cook doubled down on his company's main moneymaker Tuesday, introducing four versions of the new iPhone 13. 
There are incremental improvements like sleeker and more colorful outsides, faster processing chips inside, brighter screens, better graphic displays, and sharper cameras in these newer models, all aimed at getting those who still hold an iPhone 10 or older version to finally let go and upgrade to 5G, the next generation of wireless technology. Apple VP for product marketing for the iPhone, Kyan Drantz. Millions and millions of iPhone users are already experiencing 5G every day for super fast downloads and uploads, lower latency and new experiences on the go. The world is moving quickly to 5G. We're collaborating with more carrier partners for the best call quality, performance, coverage, and battery life. Apple isn't the only one eager to get customers to trade up. Mobile carriers are throwing in discounts that could ultimately make the cost of the upgrade free. There's an iPhone 13 mini, which starts at $699, and the iPhone 13 beginning at $799, with some wireless carriers willing to throw in up to $700 for qualifying trade-ins. And that is all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.